completely cool, they become satisfied with little and normally then they go their own way, living alone, going to a cave, a small cootie, some bells. That was definitely also near the terrace part, yeah. It's relatively safe. I was nervous about the snakes. Mm. Uh, one monk was killed here by a snake. Heavy duty poisonous ones are here. Russell bite, uh, you know, they do ones that they're one bite job. And uh, they come out at night. There's a river there with frogs and it's just mm. ideal with them, so. <laughs> Envy, Nyanavir. January 1965, I believe, when I was in Bundala, the deep jungle, thick jungle there, and I was tramping in the jungle searching for wild boar. And I went to the village there, and the villagers told me that there was a white man who was a monk there. I was surprised as a journalist, and I thought I'd go and see him to do a story later. I came back to him when Robin Mom, who was Somerset Mom's nephew, who was a travel writer, novelist, he came to Sri Lanka, so on then, Sri Lanka, and wanted to want a story. While we were talking with him, with Robin Mom, a tan tula fell from the roof, and he picked it up and he held it in his hand. We were horrified. He held it in his hand and he said, no, he's not going to hurt you. And I think the, Robin took a picture of it. The picture appeared in the, in the article, so he holding his tan tula. The older one is Robin Mom a nephew of the celebrated Somerset Maugham. He is a novelist, third rate I suspect, and a writer of travel books. Although they both seemed interested in the Dharma, I rather think that their principal reason for visiting me was to obtain material for their writings. So probably, in perhaps a year's time, there will be a new travel book with a chapter, complete with photographs, devoted to yours truly and the romantic life he is leading in the jungle. Excuse me. I wonder if I might speak with you. I heard you were living somewhere here in the jungle of Sri Lanka. So I managed to find out the exact spot and came out to meet you. How do you do? Would you care to come in? Thank you. What was amazing was this white man, Englishman, and you knew his background, how he came there, and what made him, that is more important, I think.
you were in North Africa during the campaign, intelligence officer. And yeah, after his discharge, he didn't have a, need a job in London with another friend of his who, whom he had met in the army. And they, they were, you know, sort of buying women and good times they were having. And on this annuity, he didn't have to work ever. Both of them had met somewhere in London in a pub. And then they discussed uh, their past. They were really um, dissatisfied, discontented with the life they were leading. Our past loves can be absolutely dead, even when we meet the loved one again, and so with aesthetic enjoyment. The transcendental sense of Mozart's G minor quintet, the late Beethoven, Bartok's quartets, so evident to me before I joined the army. Where was it when I got back home after the war? And then said, I said, this is not the proper life for us. Let's go and become, let's go and get ordained as Buddhist monks. So they were ordained there in Rodandua as Jnana Veera, Jnana Moli. Both studied the Pali language, studied the Dhamma. In no time, Jnanavira left Dudandu and got into the forest reserve of Bundala. What is important is not his biography, not what he did, but what he wrote. His interpretation of the Dhamma. Nobody dared, or nobody was able intellectually to counteract the notes. They criticized it because it was not traditional. It was creative, unusual, not it completely against the traditions. You see, because whatever we read and whatever we heard in the Dhamma was traditional as given in the texts and interpreted by Buddha Gosa in his commentaries. I think very, very important is, um, I think, his exposition of uh, uh, dependent co-origination, Padichamuppada. The traditional understanding of Padichamuppada was that it connects this birth, uh, past birth and the future birth. Now, I think uh, Venerable Jnanavira's explanations were very helpful in understanding that Padichamuppada is the explanation of what is happening at this very moment in us. So it was in, in uh, normally a Buddhist monk does not de deviate from the traditional teaching. He writes a lot about various readings that he did in literature and he sees the Dhamma in that literature, whatever Ulysses or whatever he reads, he sees the Dhamma. Uh, he had a very analytic mind. He's supposed to have been a very uh, expert in mathematics in the Cambridge University. However much we appreciate Venomaniela Vera and his intellectual cap capacities, a uh, kind of meditative monk like Venomaniela Vimala, he just put it aside. And he may have have a look, a look at it, but at once he took them apart, he said, this is not a necessity. You read the Buddha word. Buddha Vajana you get in the suttas. Keep to it, practice it, and there are things which are much more fundamental for young monks than looking into a highly philosophical, tendentious work like the notes on Dhamma. Venom Nyanavira saw that for him and for a good number of Westerners it would be the right path to go through the uh, uh, existentialist. In his letters he is full of, of uh, praise to certain uh, Western philosophers, Bradley, Sartre, Camus and so on, because they saw the problem of suffering, he always says that, he saw the problem of suffering, but 
they were not in a position to see the ground, the foundation of that suffering. The reader is presumed to be subjectively engaged with an anxious problem, the problem of his existence, which is also the problem of his suffering. Only in a vertical view, straight down into the abyss of his own personal existence, is a man capable of apprehending the perilous insecurity of his situation. And only a man who does apprehend this is prepared to listen to the Buddha's teaching. According to the text, really the arising of the Dhamma Chakku is entry into the first, first uh, stage of the stream, Sotapanna. That is the first, first path of the, of the realization, first, pa first part of the enlightenment, you see. He completely was giving up uh, any kind of uh, uh, establishing a foothold on experience, eternal structures anywhere, whether material or mental, are not to be had anywhere. Because it will, one day or other, it will break down, the whole structure will go. And obviously he has understood that when he saw the <clears throat> nature of uh, impermanence in the Kuti in Bundala. Dear Bhante, you know, of course, that since my early amoebiasis, my guts have continued to give me trouble. I was able to make some progress in spite of it, but in 1960 and 1962, I had fresh infections and my condition deteriorated. It attacks your guts. They called it amoebiasis because Nothing is retained, but in Hindi he says it is not amoebiasis, it was a cancer of the guts. The body was completely troubling him most of the day. You could see it from the face also, you know, that he was in a suffering condition. Tired out, yeah, worn out. In June 1962 then, I found myself once more with live amoebiasis, blood and mucus and the rest, and so I wrote to Dr. De Silva, who kindly sent me a box of pills to take. After two or three days, I began experiencing a violent erotic stimulation, as if I had taken a very strong aphrodisiac. And then, uh, later, of course, there came the other problem in, you know, with the satyriasis, too much medicines. I saw some of these bottles he had left in one kuti in the island hermitage. It's just, you got this amount of bottles, you know, from Western medicines, very strong medicines, you know, from Switzerland and all that. I mean, he must have suffered a lot. This erotic stimulation can be overcome by successful samatha practice, but my chronic amoebiasis makes this particularly difficult for me. So for me, it is simply a question of how long I can stand the strain. That's why he, he went into the notes, you know, in that intellectual faculties he had, there he found his solace, there he found his energy, there he found his... Uh, faculties that gave him actually vitality. The Dhamma, and thinking on the Dhamma and writing in doubt, that brought him up again. Otherwise, he would probably have withered away much before. In the first place, there is, for obvious reasons, a frequent and pressing invitation to disrobe. But I did not seek this nervous disorder, and I do not, in my calmer moments, see why it should be allowed to have its own way. In the second place, at the other extreme, there is suicide. Though I do not say this is good, I will say that, under the circumstances, and in the long run, 
it is better than disrobing. I am oscillating between two poles, wife or knife, as one might say. And he made, of course, attempt, even before, you know, to cut off his life. Uh, he, I think once or twice he tried to cut his veins by his knife, razor knife, you know, we had that razor knife in those days, and uh, he couldn't do it. And then one day on Pindapata, you know, he kept get the bananas and the cake and the biscuits wrapped up in papers, and then he opened the papers coming back, and then it was an English paper, you know, very strange, you know, in Humbertoda, Bundela, in those days, you know, 65, 64 maybe, 1964, and then he, there was a case, you know, in the English paper, two old English ladies commit suicide by cutting their veins. So he said, how two English ladies can do, and I cannot do, because I'm afraid. There are several very um, important instances in the discourses where uh, the disciples of the Buddha committed suicide. And then, uh, for example, uh, this disciple called Samiddhi, another disciple called Channa, uh, I think Sangamaji. So at least three or four cases of uh, the monastic disciples of the Buddha committing suicide. But the interesting thing is in the process of, I mean, they, they, these people were so developed according to the discourse, according to this particular account, uh, in the process of committing suicide, they attain Arhantur. As he knew that he is not an Agahat, he would have not the right to commit suicide. What kind of offense was this kind of suicide? If one commits suicide for a monk, according to Nyanavira's interpretation, it is a dukkata. That is a very small offense, the smallest offense we have. Other Sinhalese monks uh, had a different opinion about suicide for a non-Arahat. They were of the opinion that it is a very grave offense. They couldn't define it, but they actually thought that it could be close to Parajika even. Because if you kill another person, or you make another person commit suicide because of your advice, then you are Parajika and you're no longer a monk. So they became quite uh, averse to Venamiyanavira's terror as a person after his suicide. When I first went to Vajrayarama, in that gangway, two large photos, Venamiyanamoli, Venamiyanavira in the gangway. Next time, after two years I came back maybe, after the suicide of Nyanavira, Nyanavira's picture was removed. So obviously it was the chief monks there, all they came together and discussed the matter and they removed him because uh, they wanted to show that we are not in agreement with any kind of suicide whether it is under conditions of sickness or conditions of uh, despair, mental despair. And even if he, if he you know, uh, was a Sotapanna, they would say that even a Sotapanna would be very careful to take his life because he knew anyway it is an offense, however small it was. So he fell into a kind of disgrace with... Uh, one of the learned sanghas in Colombo.
Kemudian dari hitian satu, nama satu yang berusaha bisa berusaha satu, nama satu itu menghitian, namun teh hamdulillah kisimu ini, pada dia kuning, 